if we eat to satisfaction and we balance our blood sugar or regulate those hunger hormones, there is a world in which you don't have to think about food for four to six hours till your next meal and you will feel fully satisfied, energetic, and ready to go. Hey friends, welcome to Keep It Simple Sexy. I'm Christine Bullock, founder of KO Body Care, certified fitness trainer, and mom of three little girls who's just trying to juggle it all and feel as good as possible, all while helping you do the same. I'm so grateful that you're here. Now let's get started, sexy. This episode is brought to you by KO Body Care, the leader in face-grade body care and supplements for total body wellness. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Keeping Simple Sexy. I hope your new year is just going beautifully and smooth and you're accomplishing those goals that you've set for yourself so far. Today's guest is going to help you do the same thing. Today, we have a Hollywood mainstay, Kelly Levesque, a holistic nutritionist and wellness expert and best-selling author. I have the book right here, A Body Love, Live in Balance, Weigh What You Want, and Free Yourself from Food Drama Forever. Her deep desire to help her clients, her passion for human nutrition, and her curiosity about how the body works is why everyone from clients like Jessica Alba, Molly Sims, Kate Walsh, and even our former guest, Lindsay Price, turned to her to feel and look terrific. Her practical approach to wellness helped her clients and fans to transform their health and their lives through nourishing whole foods and body-loving practices. I'm a huge fan of her podcast, Be Well by Kelly, for all the newest wellness information and her Fab Four recipes, which focus on providing your body the proper fuel to thrive. And we want you thriving in this new year. So today let's dive into her fab four fundamentals, how to balance blood sugar and reduce cravings and find out why in a world of vegan, she has a protein brand made with grass fed beef, how to rid ourselves of food drama forever. And of course, how to eat well to be well. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Hey, Christine. Thanks (laughs) for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us and joining our viewers. I mean, you are absolutely the go-to nutritionist for (laughs) celebrities. And they just love you like a friend too. You know, it's like you've great created such great long-term relationships and you've been with these people. So that is a testament to you. You've been with them for a long time. Oh, yeah. I know. I I feel really blessed to have an amazing group of women as clients. And I think the reason I have longevity with these women is because I'm a realist. Like I am a mom. I'm an (laughs) entrepreneur. I know what it's like to try to eat clean when you're traveling or at an airport and, you know, or if your husband brings home like donuts or a pizza, like I, I've been there and I get it. And so I just like to give real life tools and help them learn how to balance our blood sugar. And that's, I mean, that's the key to longevity. That's the key to preventing chronic lifestyle diseases. And so I like to keep it really simple and actionable. Well, I'm really excited because I need all those actionable tips right now. And I'm really interested to hear about the, you know, all the blood sugar and share that with the viewers too. But let's go backwards for a second. And how did you get into nutrition? And was there ever a time that you were not so balanced in your, your diet? Uh, definitely. And lifestyle. So, yeah. Uh, I grew up a soccer player. I fell in love with nutrition in my freshman year of high school. I took health as my science course, but I didn't really think it could be a career. So I went to USC, um, in Southern California for business, actually business finance. I called my dad, my senior year in tears <laughs> that I should be pre-med or kinesiology or an RD. And he said, that's great, honey, but, um, you're going to graduate next year. So if you want to go back, go for it. I ultimately took extra classes to concentrate in nature of human health and disease and spent eight years in cancer and genetics. So I had a a big career prior to this, um, you know, my passion project that did become my full-time career. And what was was eight years in studying? Oh my goodness. Eight years in cancer and genetics. I worked on the business side. So I was working, um, I was working for companies that did tumor mapping. So we looked at the genes of specific tumors like breast, um, breast tumors for women with breast cancer, ovarian tumors. We were mapping the genes that were turned on or turned up that, that were the feeding pathways so that we could better target treatment. And so all I did in my career for eight years was read studies and it was mostly about cancer, um, but would find myself in that research looking into nutrition and trying to understand that, that, um, side of things. My, the course I took my senior year at USC, which was nature of human health and disease. I had to write a paper. My, the, 
my end thesis was on type 2 diabetes. So that was a real eye-opening experience for me because for a long time, I was really into health. Like I, I got the health magazines, Shape, Women's, you know, Women's Health. I really poured myself into the diet books that were of the early 90s. And it was all low carb, <laughs> A lot of low those, fat. which is why I'm laughing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was- I have them from the 80s from my mom yeah. too. So. <laughs> so you're like, okay, let's take yeah. it back to snack well cookies, rice cake, yeah. <laughs> Ole- weird Olean chips. And then you fast Breaker forward- cleanse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> soup cleanse, cabbage yeah. soup cleanse. Yeah. So you, then you fast forward to the low carb era. And what was mm-hmm. interesting for me is all of those books, whether it's Atkins or South Beach or Protein Power or kind of like these popular diet books of that era, really all they were doing was encouraging protein, whole foods, vegetables, um, high fiber fruits. And when you look at the prevention of chronic lifestyle diseases, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, even some of these like which is PCOS. So some That's of what these, I have. I have it. Yeah. Yeah. Some of mm-hmm. these um, diagnoses that would be made at your gynecologist's office, mm-hmm. are, they're metabolically driven and mm-hmm. they have a lot to do with insulin and inflammation in the body. But no one was really talking about it like that. And so for me, it's really hard to get a PDF of eat and do not eat. Like I read the books and then the follow through for me, was, and I joke, and I've told people this on other podcasts was you know, my parents shopped at Costco. I'm reading the Atkins diet with my hand in the gallon container of, <laughs> of goldfish, you know? So it was, and it was for me more for the science. It really truly was. And this desire to, you know, you look at all the biohackers now, it's this desire to just really push yourself and to be the best version of yourself. I didn't hate my body at that time. I was an athlete. I was, I was, um, pretty active, but it's it does set the stage of it's never good enough. Like, well, mm-hmm. I don't hate it, but like five pounds would be great or, mm-hmm. you know. Or even performing better. Yeah, exactly. So all mm-hmm. these things that come into young women's minds in their early 20s. And so for me, I felt like blood sugar was really freeing. I was like, wow, your body's amazing. Like you eat, you know, different macronutrients, protein, fat, carbohydrates, and your body is constantly trying to bring your blood sugar down. Like it has this, these hormones and this mechanism to pick up this energy and store it in your liver and in your muscles for energy. And that made sense to me. Like that's old carbo loading science where Mm -hmm. you were ever an athlete and they said, Oh, have a big pasta party. And then this weekend you're going to play your sports. What they were doing was really loading you up with carbohydrates, storing that sugar as glycogen in your muscles. So you'd have all this energy to run around. But what What I learned from blood sugar science was that if you could gradually elongate your blood sugar curve and it wasn't this high spike and hard crash, you had more energy, less cravings, you you felt your best and you were able to use your brain in a way that didn't, you didn't feel distracted or phonetic. And so Mm -hmm. when you think about Mm -hmm. high blood sugar, that's like going to a birthday party, going to a sleepover when you're young, eating a bunch of candy feeling really hyper, and then really feeling the crash. Mm -hmm. And if you look back in the day, they said five to six small meals a day to stoke your metabolism, to balance your blood sugar. I'm using air quotes because none of that is true. We know that um, it's harder on your thyroid and your body, it's digestion digestion processes to have or eat constantly five to six six small meals a day. Because Mm -hmm. what we're doing is we have a you know, a snack or a meal that contains some carbohydrates, our blood sugar goes up. It hasn't come back down yet. We load it up again, but, and then again and again and again, over time, our blood, our fasting blood sugar is going up and we're really just filling up with blood sugar, filling up with insulin, elevating our blood sugar and increasing our inflammation. So for me, I'm like, well, how can I eat a meal feel really satisfied, elongate that blood sugar curve. So it's not a spike and a crash, but really, so I feel sustained until that next meal. Mm -hmm. And then I can eat what I love to feel satisfied and full and not think about food between meals. Cause I think that's, there's always this constant loop in so many of my clients heads and it was in mine for a long time and women in general, even men, not as often, but, but for a lot of us, it's like, let's stop thinking about food. Why am I worried about my next meal or my next snack? And sometimes it's boredom and sometimes it's, uh, it's not about the food. Sometimes it's about feeling like 
you have stress coming down from your boss or you're worried about a family situation. There's a lot of things that influence our food choices, but Mm -hmm. if we eat to satisfaction and we balance our blood sugar or regulate those hunger hormones, there is a world in which you don't have to think about food for four to six hours till your next meal and you will feel fully satisfied energetic and ready to go. And so that was always my goal for my clients. And a lot of that came down to really encouraging proper protein consumption. I have so many people with suboptimal protein intake. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of animal-based products. And I really coach my clients on ways to find regenerative farms and, and high quality proteins. But there is something to be said about being able to go six hours without thinking about a meal. And a lot of times it comes to buy, get down to bioavailable protein, good sources of fiber that slow down that digestion to your next meal. Can we, I mean, I'm kind of, we're, I'm jumping ahead of, you know, diving into some stuff, but I, I think so too, in the sense that getting into animal protein versus like vegan, I'm sure you do have some clients and you can, you know, create a program around that too. But I know that when I was a vegan myself, or I've been a vegetarian, I've been vegan I, it felt great at first. And then I, my energy really depleted. And then I actually started gaining weight almost because I started losing muscle, even if at the Mm. same fitness level or more, I just couldn't keep up, keep up with it. What have you found? What is the difference in the proteins that you've seen within blood sugar and sustaining that, that insulin level? Absolutely. Well, one complete proteins are more satisfying and Mm. regulate more hunger hormones in the body than incomplete proteins. And that's going to be Animal-based proteins are complete. Plant-based proteins, some are complete proteins, um, but most aren't. You have to Mm -hmm. pair proteins to get a complete protein or, you know, that's when people say eat rice and beans together or Mm -hmm. chickpeas and seeds and your hummus is a complete protein. But that's one layer, right? And then we want to think about um, the bio beyond is it complete or incomplete? The bioavailability of that protein is really different too. Mm. So it's about half as bioavailable as a animal complete protein. And even an animal's like a complete animal protein can sometimes be, let's take an example of 20 grams of a complete protein from say like fish or chicken. You may only be able to absorb 10 to 14 grams of that. And if we're talking about a vegan protein, it's really like less than 10 probably closer to five to eight grams of that is what you're absorbing. So there's a drastic difference in how someone might feel if they're absorbing five grams of protein versus 14 grams of protein. Yeah. And how much you would have to eat then and how tired your digestive system would be kind of going back to that eating all day then because your blood sugar is probably up even on a plant diet if you're eating more to sustain that protein too and get a higher level. And I think what people don't realize is the majority of animal proteins are really dense in protein. And there's a there's no carbohydrates and there's a minimal amount of fat depending mm-hmm. on the protein that you're eating. You can choose, you know, uh, to have chicken or salmon. Salmon's going to have a little more fat than chicken. Um, you can have a lean piece of red meat. Like you can, you can really manipulate the fat percentages, but keep your protein concentration high. And then when we look at plant-based proteins, the only way you can do that is in a protein powder. Mm -hmm. So when you look at plant-based proteins, you're talking about beans, nuts, seeds. And when you look at them, beans are actually mostly carbohydrates. There's a lot of carbohydrates that you have to digest through and that can create a blood sugar roller coaster. So people can have elevated blood sugar trying to get enough protein in. And the same goes for See nuts and seeds, they're primarily fat. And if you're not leaning into a ketogenic diet or a low carbohydrate diet, and you're pairing these fats with high dense carbohydrates, like um, processed like toast or breads or pastas, it really can do a number on your blood sugar. So you're going to have an elevation from the dense carbohydrates in your blood sugar, which is going to cause an elevation elevation in insulin. Insulin is the hormone of storage. It stores all of that sugar in your body, but it's also really good at storing fat and it shuts down all lipolysis. So this elevation, elevated blood sugar creates an elevation in insulin, which which shuts down your, your body's ability to burn its own fat for fuel. And we're in a storage mode. So what you're talking about is low bioavailability of protein. So the ability to hold on to your muscle mass, even if you're working out really hard, is really difficult for vegans. Um, I, I, you know, Brennan, the founder of Vega, mm-hmm. he 
he that's created, funny. He just popped into my head. <laughs> I was he like, did. He yeah. did a great job at it. Mm -hmm. He was very dedicated to the craft. He created a whole line of products around it. Mm -hmm. But that's not the people that I'm seeing. That's not the clients who've decided yeah. to be a lifestyle vegan. They are not taking their protein consumption seriously. They're not taking their B12 consumption seriously, their vitamin D co consumption seriously, their mineral, mineral consumption seriously. And they think that they're going to be able to get everything from the foods that they're eating. And unfortunately, what happens is exactly what you talk about. You feel light. You start to lose weight. Your cholesterol goes down. I mean, we can have a totally other conversation on whether that's good or not. Depends mm -hmm. on depends on other markers and like your inflammatory markers on your blood test. But you start to feel light and your digestion feels easy. You've got a lot of enzymes in your body and you start to, you do, you start to lose muscle mass and fat mass. So you feel thinner. You put your clothes on easier. You're like, wow, this is really working for you. I was surging with energy. But what ends up happening is iron depletes, B12 de depletes, uh, B6 depletes. You have a, you have vitamin D deficiency and these are choline deficiency. A lot of these um, fat soluble vitamins, water soluble vitamins and, and minerals are not, they're not like, they're very critical minerals. I have to say if someone were to get pregnant, that's, just, that's the only thing, because I did write my second book. Um, and I have a chapter from a plant-based devotee. I have clients who are plant-based, but you better believe when I get to sit down with them, we take it as seriously as I'm being right now on this podcast, because I don't want them to end up with major nutrient deficiencies and then have a low immune system and then have gain infertility, have, infertility, yeah, gain weight. have weight gain. Because what happens is exactly what you said. When you talk about when your blood sugar goes, goes up because you've eaten carbohydrates of any form, your the same thing happens every time. Insulin is released. It picks up this blood sugar. It starts to put it away places. So you have this tank, which is your liver. That's the first tank. You're going to dump a little bit of that sugar in your liver, and then it's going to start to deposit it in your muscles. Well, what happens if you have, let's say, lar like large muscles? You have a, a two pound quadricep, right? And then you are vegan and you lose weight and now it's one pound and you feel great putting your jeans on, but that same carbohydrate load that you've always been able to eat, now we fill up that that one mm. lean pound and your blood sugar stays elevated because there's no space left for it in your muscle and your blood sugar is staying elevated and insulin staying elevated. And so that sugar is being sucked up again by your liver. It's being converted to a triglyceride or a fat and it's going to be stored that way. And ultimately you're killing your metabolism over time because yes. our muscle mass is our metabolism. Our yeah. muscle mass is our longevity. And so for me, it's like, how can I get you excited about eating protein? Because it literally kills hunger. It, it keeps you full and satisfied. It's the most dense in, in all of your fat soluble vitamins, which is vitamin D, E, A, and K, the most dense and critical minerals for health. And if you are anywhere near your full, fertile years, I am talking about iron, zinc, uh, selenium for your, for your thyroid health. I'm talking about choline. These are all absolutely critical. I'm in my first trimester of my third pregnancy, actually. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Which is why I'm so slightly out of breath. Good luck with the uh, third. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I was one of three, so I always wanted um, it, but yeah. I, I get very serious yeah. about this period of time because yeah. iron and choline are directly related to fetal IQ scores, cognitive development. These are so so critical. And it's not mm -hmm. just for you, it's for your child. And I, and I get really worried about, um, really the propaganda that I see online. Uh, and I, it's funny really, during my, my yeah. first pregnancy, I was still not eating that much meat and fish and all of that when I had started to eat it again. But my first pregnancy, like first trimester, I needed to suddenly eat so much meat. I was just like what I had to live off. And it's, you know, a sign that that's what, and from there on out, that's what I've like lived off postnatally. I still, because I was working, you know, two weeks in or something like that, 40 hours plus had the newborn, like you just need energy. And it was the only thing to sustain me. So naturally your body kind of knows that stuff. Yeah. And it's just, it's so bioavailable and it mm -hmm. is so satisfying and it, it, and it really supports blood sugar because 
when you look at carbohydrates, they break down to blood sugar, right? But when you look at protein and fat and fiber, those aren't breaking down to blood sugar or they're breaking down to very, very, very small amounts. And that is where we get satisfaction and the essential nutrients we need, which are essential amino acids from protein, essential fatty acids from fat. There's no essential carbohydrate. And so that's where you're going to see people promote a carnivore diet, a ketogenic diet. Look, I love gut health. I love skin health. You aren't going to see me go all the way there. Mm -hmm. I do love protein. I, I like when my clients eat it you know, a significant or, or an optimal amount of protein for their body mass. Mm -hmm. But I love leafy greens. We know that a cup of dark leafy greens a day, ha when we look at scans, has brains that perform 11 years younger on average. So we look at cruciferous vegetables and their ability to support liver health, herbs and spices, same thing. We're talking about detoxification of the liver, being able to detoxify everything from old cholesterol, old estrogen, any kind of toxin like aldehyde from wine or alcohol, anything that we're in contact with from, you know, our environment, endocrine disrupting chemicals. So there is definitely when it comes to gut health, skin health, immune system, detoxification, there is a major push for produce, veggies, fruits, nuts and seeds, things that are going to support the microbiome. Um, but it is, it is interesting that when we look at it, for our human bodies, there is not an essential carbohydrate. So I do bang the drum and wave the flag like, yes, you still need to eat these things and here's why. But healthier um, versions of them too, you know, right. and in moderation. Absolutely. And, and I think the coolest part about whole foods, and I think this is mother nature, is that all the sugar and starches of those carbohydrates are wrapped in a fiber cell. You have to chew through it. You have to digest through it. It's slow. It's a slow drip of blood sugar versus mm -hmm a soda, an orange juice, yeah. a Gatorade, um, sugar in its, in its, you know, processed form or flowers mm -hmm. in their processed form. So not to say, like I said, at the beginning of this podcast, I'm absolutely a realist. Like yeah. I'm a mom, I'm an entrepreneur. We make cookies in this house, you know, and there's just ways that I think about them through, through the lens of blood sugar. I'm like, okay, well, can I use an almond flour and a coconut yeah. flour in replacement of a traditional wheat flour? Mostly for me, um, not because I want to be paleo by any means, but but mostly for me, based on blood sugar. Those are mm -hmm. higher in fiber, higher in fat, higher in protein than a refined flour from wheat, which is mostly carbohydrates. The Keep It Simple Sexy podcast is brought to you by KO Body Care. Uh oh, guys, I'm going to fill you in on something. My pants are fitting a little tight today. Have you guys ever felt the same, a little bloated, ate something that didn't mix well with your tummy? Well, I'm going to let you in on my personal hack. KO Body Care's clean plant-based supplement, Bloat Be Gone, and it will be gone. As the founder and CEO of KO, we spent so long getting these formulas perfect, and this one really works instantly. Our customers are just as obsessed with it as I am. What I love about this one is that it soothes bloating and digestive discomfort fast while healing over time. So I always slip this one in my purse. I'm going out to dinner and that way I could throw it in some water, drink it and feel great. Try it out for yourself and see the bloat and discomfort start to disappear, leaving you feeling your best. Head to kobodycare.com and use our code KISS20 for 20% off your first purchase. So you've kind of mentioned some of the ways that we can balance blood sugar, which is proteins, probably stretching our meals, watching that we're not doing too many meals. Um, one, do you have any other tips for balancing that blood sugar? And do you believe in intermittent fasting then? Because that yes. kind of drops yeah. down. Okay. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about what turns to blood sugar and then mm -hmm. you can – so what turns to blood, blood sugar is carbohydrates. So mm -hmm. what doesn't turn to blood sugar is protein, fat, and fiber. So the FAB4, which is a little checklist that I create for my clients, is protein, mm -hmm. fat, fiber, and greens uh, or vegetables deep in color. So we look, use that little checklist and we say, okay, is there a source of protein on your plate? Do you have a source of healthy fat? And that may be olives, avocado, you cooked with olive oil, um, something of that nature. And then fiber and greens is where are your veggies? If you are using a fruit, I love low glycemic fruits like berries. Maybe you're using an apple or a pear in fall, something like that. Try to keep it seasonal. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you've kind of checked those things off, 
if you see there are other things on your plate that break down to blood sugar or mostly carbohydrates, then you know that those are going to be the things that elevate blood sugar. So whenever I'm working with a client, we may look at a meal and I help moms support their children's blood sugar balance as well. I have a course for pregnancy. I have a course for moms trying to support their kids to balance their blood sugar because it can be difficult. But let's use an example of a kid's meal. Um, your mom, you're a mom and you're making, you know, even oatmeal or waffles for your kid. Let's, let's say that you're making oatmeal for your kid. And so you're like, oatmeal is healthy. I'm going to make oatmeal. So you have oats on the stove and you make it with water, or maybe you make it with coconut milk and then you add berries and then you add some sugar. Like you're using coconut sugar because it's less refined. Well, let's look at what those are. So you have oats, which is a carbohydrate. So that's a spike. You have berries. That's a spike. And then you have the sugar, the maple syrup, and that's a spike. So that's three carbohydrate sources that have what I would call doubled down. You tripled down on the blood sugar spike. You have nothing that's elongating that blood sugar, blood sugar curve. There's nothing that's going to keep your child or yourself full from that breakfast point all the way until lunch. You're going to need a snack because there's no source of protein, there's no source of healthy fat, and there's no source of real fiber. And oatmeal is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because it's really sold as a fiber-rich food. But mm -hmm. when we look at a cup of broccoli is going to have twice as much uh, yeah. fiber as yeah. oatmeal. And so it's, it's a nice way to sell it, but it's really not there. So here's what I would do. I would say, okay, well, let's pull the most aggressive form of carbohydrates, which is um, the refined sugar or maple syrup. Let's pull that off the top. How mm -hmm. can we add a, a protein to this? Well, instead of sweetening with that maple syrup, you could use a little vanilla protein and mix it in. If you don't want to use a protein powder, if you're doing a stove oatmeal, you can actually crack two eggs in it, mix it up. It's going to make it really super fluffy, and you're going to add 12 grams of protein to that, to that little meal. And then you say, okay, well, how can I add – some fat. So this is the protein part of the fat board. Then you say fat. Well, I'll add a tablespoon of almond butter to it or, uh, you know, some, some nuts. slivered nuts or something mm -hmm. on top. So if you like the crunch and then how do I add a little fiber? Well, my love is actually to swap out oats for chia, flax meal, and hemp parts. And I do what I call the faux meal or fake oatmeal. Um, but let's say your family just loves oatmeal. You can add two tablespoons of chia to that mix on the stove or um, add a little bit of flax meal to it. You're gonna, It's going to make it thicker. It's going to be more filling. There's a little bit of extra fat, a little extra fiber. And then all of a sudden, instead of this meal being something that elevates your blood, blood sugar 20 to 30 points, if we were tracking your blood glucose, it may be something that elevates your blood sugar 15 points and that protein, fat, and fiber actually keeps you full for four hours versus a traditional blood sugar curve when it's a highly dense carbohydrate meal. On average, you go up 90 minutes and then you crash out at 90 minutes, which is the three-hour mark. So when we look at old science that says you should have five to six meals a, meals a day to balance your blood sugar, what they're really doing is they're keeping you from a hypoglycemic crash. They say, in three hours, Christine is going to be so hungry, so let's just give her a snack. And at this point, we'll give her an apple and a cheese stick, or we'll give her a yogurt, or we'll, and you think of all the traditional snacks that would happen between breakfast and lunch, when in reality, your blood sugar might not all the way be back down in a healthy range or a low mm -hmm. fasting range. And so that snack is actually going to drive your blood sugar back up even higher. And so over time throughout the day, we have this curve that doesn't go up and down evenly. It goes up a little bit, down a little bit, up even higher, down a little bit, up even higher. And so over time, we see this curve just ascending. And then you crash at night probably, right? Which is you crash at night, do. three or four o'clock in the afternoon, the cravings for caffeine are really high. The cravings for sugar are really high. We have obsessive thoughts about food, extra late night eating. When we have elevated mm. blood sugar and when we are following that trend, that's when we actually feel really out of control around food between, let's say, three or four in the afternoon and when we decide to shut it down. Wow. I've so, been there before. So it's like, you know, that's amazing to me because of um, – even when I thought it was healthy too, but like working all day as a trainer and not really being able to eat and then maybe, but also being able to eat anything that I wanted to. So I have like a smoothie from Equinox and it's just full of sugars and maybe has a little protein in it, but it's the <clears throat> vegan form of the protein too, you know, but it's <clears throat> full of fruit and delicious. And then you go and you eat like a little chocolate snack or whatever with the salad during the day. So I wasn't really getting the 
the longevity, if that, to be honest, yeah. if that, because you just work and stop and you get home and it's just like, I am so hungry. Give me a bag of potato chips. Totally. And honestly, that's, that's one of the biggest problems. Anytime I sit down with a new client mm-hmm. is under eating and with intermittent fasting. I know you mentioned that earlier, that's mm-hmm. become like a really popular trend. Intermittent fasting is, a, is amazing. What it does by shrinking your feeding window. I mean, I just saw a study that came out and it was comparing low carb eating to an eight hour feeding window, intermittent fasting, and then both. And it's amazing to see the decrease in visceral fat. That's the fat around your organs, the decrease in, in, in all of your subcutaneous fat. That's the stuff that like kind of sits on, on top, um, decrease in A1C and in, in insulin and glucose, um, decrease in C-reactive protein which is a a marker of inflammation. I mean, phenomenal results. Mm -hmm. Here is my warning to women who wait too long. I have seen it not backfire as often with men, but when women jump on the intermittent fasting train and they don't eat until 2 p.m. and then they decide to eat and they are not breaking their fast with a blood sugar balancing optimal protein meal – yeah. It is one coming off fasting into a bag of potato chips actually increases blood sugar higher than if you would have just had breakfast mm-hmm. and it increases inflammation. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of person are you? For me, 2 p.m. is not, it doesn't fly. I can't be. And also, I'm in this stage of life where I'm feeding toddlers, I'm up yeah. at five in the morning, I'm breastfeeding yeah. or pregnant. I mean, like, I'll have looked back to 2017 and be like, I, my body was never my own and yeah. <laughs> I like I am trying my best to get sleep but it, the my best nights are when I like go to bed at 8:30 or 9 and that's yeah. hard to c- come yeah. by sometimes mm-hmm. when you're an mm-hmm. entrepreneur. So mm-hmm. it is it is really interesting but for me I say I, I've always said this eat with the sun, eat with the circadian rhythm. So if you get up and you want so for us if I'm up at f- 5.30 or 6 is the be the very latest mm-hmm. and I don't have my breakfast till 8, that is two hours after waking up, maybe three. And then I finish dinner and finish eating at 5 or 6 o'clock at night. Yeah. That's how I fast. I have people shrink it to the middle of the day because when we wait too long and we're too hungry – we really make up for it on the back end. And we do start to have these obsessive thoughts about food. Our bodies are going to be in search of really palatable, highly caloric foods. And yeah. I just think most and we think of- we can eat them because we haven't eaten for so long. Exactly. And what is really great for metabolic health is actually finishing dinner three hours before you go to bed because one, you metabolize all of that food and you bring your blood sugar back down to hopefully a, um, you know, moderate to low blood sugar number, not low in a bad way, but low in a, in a, in a healthy metabolic way. Mm -hmm. And then what happens? We have phenomenal lymphatic cleansing. We start becoming, um, fat adaptive and, and metabolically flexible to burn fat for fuel. And, we do the best work at that while we sleep. So mm-hmm. um, way, way better than waiting till two and eating till 10. I think exactly. And I think too, not knowing the science that you know, you know, and having your expertise, but just recommending clients when they're like, I intermittent fast and doing all these things, you know, but I'm not seeing, I'm like, just change your window. Like yeah. you're eating till, you know, 10 o'clock, you're going out every night. And, you know, I mean, if that's your lifestyle, that's your lifestyle. But if you go so much early, because then you're coming home and it's the same thing, it's not necessarily about the weight or the metabolism. It is about your full pro aging and your like longevity and what you're doing to your body and how it's depleting it. Mm -hmm. Speaking of depleting, you mentioned at the very beginning that diabetes and PCOS, there were common markers because as you're talking what I was so interested in this and within blood sugar, it is kind of very similar to what happens in diabetes, but PCOS is very similar to diabetes as well. So is it something that this ends up kind of turning on in the system? The insulin turns on as well, and it obviously isn't going to assist, but I feel like too, I'm wondering if it's something that if you kick control of this, does it really assist in the other and, you know, turning down the symptoms of it too. Cause I mean, I've gotten knocked up now when I couldn't get knocked up for years. So I feel like I'm like, I must be doing something okay for my PCOS at this point. Absolutely. First of all, I have so many polycystic ovarian um, syndrome clients who ha- have had pregnancies, gotten naturally pregnant without the support of IVF. Mm-hmm. I have 
PCOS clients who've used IVF and, and mm-hmm. thank God for that. Um, but yes, so polycystic ovarian syndrome is insulin resistance manifesting itself in your ovaries. So you want to think there are two types of polycystic ovarian syndrome body types, actually. You have people who, um, do present more like type two diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. It's easy for them to put on weight. Um, excess androgens show up in the form of facial hair, uh, and things like that. And then on the flip side, I think people don't realize, but I have very thin clients who have PCOS as well. And that's to me, sometimes slightly more dangerous because it's diagnosed so much later. And if they're really on a fertility journey, it can be really hard to identify. Um, But the reality is they're not doing a good job putting away the sugar that they're eating, but they're constantly berating their body with sugar, having it in... um, having their insulin elevate, and then it's manifesting in this form of cysts producing instead of um, instead of eggs in their ovaries. And so what we want to do is we want to bring those insulin levels down, and we can do that with food. Food is one of the biggest levers that we can pull. Now, that being said, um, hormone disruption is happening a lot t- now, today, more than ever. And, you know, we see that even men have has, half the testosterone that our grandparents have at this age. So, which is scary. And when you, when you predict sperm count in 2045, it's zero, which is a problem because we're oh. talking about, right? Oh my God. <laughs> if the, I mean, this is trends continuing in the way yeah. that they're going. And it's very unfortunate because there are just a lot of, when I say endocrine disrupting chemicals, I'm talking about phthalates and PUFAs and things that are in our environment that act like estrogen in the body. And that can really disrupt our insulin sensitivity. It can really disrupt our sex hormones. And so whenever I have a client with with any form of any chronic lifestyle disease, whether it's, like I said, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, um, you know, type 2 diabetes, PCOS, even hypothyroidism, for example, a lot of times is, is caused by autoimmunity. We look at everything. So we pull out all of the chemicals from their cleaning supplies, from their beauty products, from their skincare products. We pull all the plastic water bottles and we switch everything to stainless steel. I pull out all the nonstick pans out of their cab, you know, out of their cabinets from their kitchen. We get really serious about all the extra things that could be having an effect on them. And then once that's all out of their house and their home, we don't stress when we go out to restaurants and we don't think like, oh, I can't eat out and I need to worry about this. No, there are Your body's be more day- capable of fighting those chemicals and all that kind of stuff when it's not overloaded all the time. Exactly. We're just lowering the toxic load as much as we can, controlling the controllable. And then we say, okay, how can we pull the lever for food? And that's Mm -hmm. really where I lean in with clients and I make sure that they understand how blood sugar works. Because I think when people start to think about blood sugar, the only real tools they were taught was put a little almond butter on your apple. Well, your apple is a carbohydrate source. Almond butter is protein, fat, and fiber. So always just Think about the Fab Four because it goes beyond adding a, you know, a spoonful of almond butter to your apple. It really truly is looking at the composition of your meal and asking yourself, okay, well, how many carbohydrate sources do I have here? And do I have the balancing protein, fat, and fiber to make this meal last in my body between meals from breakfast to lunch, from lunch to dinner so that it's not – you're not eating every two hours, but you really can go four to six hours. Mm-hmm. I love this. And as I'm sitting here, I was intermittent fasting this morning just because we've been shooting podcasts too. And I ran down (laughs) to get something to eat and it's like Monday here. So I haven't Mm. gone grocery shopping or anything yet. So the refrigerator is barren. And I was like, I just have a piece of toast with avocado and my vegan piece of cheese. So I'm like, (laughs) crap. (laughs) No, no. See, this is horrible, but I didn't get the protein really, which I really do need. But I was like, you, you bring up actually a really good point. Um, being that I'm in the first trimester of my pregnancy, I've been slightly (laughs) nauseous this entire time. I do only want toast. It's part of it. Here's the deal. We just don't eat naked carbohydrates because naked Mm -hmm. carbo, if you were to just have had that toast on its own, like I'll just have a piece of toast. 
-hmm. That toast on its own would have digested really, really quickly, spiked your blood sugar and crashed out. That would have Mm -hmm. made you feel like you had a hard time concentrating. You couldn't put your thoughts together. Maybe you'd really be thinking about food. When you (sighs) layered on that avocado, that's a healthy Mm -hmm. source of fat and it's loaded with fiber. Used half an avocado, that's five grams of fiber. That's more than any bowl of oatmeal. So um, so you layer that on. And then the vegan cheese, I'm I'm assuming it's probably primarily a fat source, oh, like coconut, a coconut yeah. oil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, okay, you have a little extra fat. Your body's going to need some protein. So figure out whatever protein source you're having after these podcasts are over yeah. and lean into that. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> because yeah. you've taken such a big break, I would say mm-hmm. you really want to sit down to a meal that has at least 30 grams of protein so that you're getting that muscle protein synthesis and you don't have muscle deterioration after a day like today. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, this is why I love interviewing you guys, the experts on this podcast, because – I just, I'm not only do I learn so much, but it refreshes so much too. Cause I think you go through ebbs and flows too with your life and what you go through. Right. And, um, it, it, it just really goes the importance of like mom, especially when you are so busy and doing all these things to take care, like put your oxygen mask on you first and take care of you first so that you're not, cause you need a lot of patience to deal with little kids (laughs) And, and businesses and everything else. So you talk a lot about food drama in your body love book. Is this, what is food drama compared to the dealing with like blood sugar? Yeah. Well, I think it really just has to do with a lot of the noise around diet and lifestyle. And like I was mentioning, the eat and do not eat PDF list. It's really easy for a food Mm -hmm. to be deemed as toxic or a problem. I want everyone listening to this podcast to know that oatmeal is not, the worst thing you could ever eat. I think, you know, when we think about it, we have to think about it in a gray scale of how can I make this exactly what I want it to be, nourishing, dense, satisfying, and enjoyable um, by elevating what's what the composition of the recipe is and what the meal is in totality. And so – but we really can get in our heads. There's a big uh, – problem with orthorexia right now where we hear that that? orthorexia is a form of an eating disorder where people only eat a certain number of foods. You know, I've had clients that eat only four foods and the same four foods because those are the ones that they think are are, are the healthiest or Mm -hmm. why they're the best for you. And, um, And that just gets hard because when you start to get on the internet and you're following someone who's carnivore and they're saying only red meat is good and and egg yolks and salmon. And then you follow someone who is plant-based and they're telling you all the reasons why egg yolks are, you know, something horrible. And they use – I mean, I'm not even going to use the term here that people use about eggs. But it's like these these terms get into people's heads in a way – to where they feel paralyzed to make food choices. They yes. don't know what's healthy anymore. And that feels like drama. Like to me, it's like when you get to the, the restaurant and you look at the menu and you feel overwhelmed by the choices because you don't know what is healthier. You don't know if there's sugar in your dressing if you order the salad or should it be gluten-free or should you be dairy-free? or And there's all this anxiety around what's supposed to be a really joyful breaking of bread with food friends and family. And so for me, blood sugar is really freeing. General categories of protein, fat, fiber, and greens <laughs> feels like, woo, uh, it would, my book could be a three by five card, you know, protein, <laughs> fat, fiber, and, and greens, flip it over. <laughs> if you forget, pictures, flip, me, yeah. flip me over. Like yeah. that's the kind of lifestyle. It's something that I could easily Mm-hmm. It's something that I use pregnant. It's something that I use when I'm like, oh gosh, I'm like serving up my kids like crackers and yes. other things on the side, like apples. And then they want the, the grapes from the fridge. And I'm like, oh shoot, that's like all three carbohydrates. Like I need some avocado on this plate or I need a hummus or I need some turkey roll-ups or I need, you know, what's left over from the, from the fridge, that protein that I can throw on their mm-hmm. plate or something. Mm-hmm. And like you, there are days when you're like, whoop in the fridge and you're like, oh, all right. We need to go to the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Shut those fridge doors. Um, but to have those things and to know like that you're looking to add to your plate, not subtract, and you're looking to balance your plate, not say that anything is ever off limits, is what 
ditching the drama is for me. It's food freedom. It's I can eat out at any restaurant I want to eat out at. I can make I can order directly from the menu. I can make swaps to make it feel great. Like big, nice restaurants in L.A. that Chris and I used to love to go to prior to having toddlers that went to bed at 630 <laughs> would be like John and Vinny's or Pisana. These are mm-hmm. really these are phenomenal, very Italian pizza pasta yeah. restaurants. Yeah. But what, what I would tell my clients is what I would tell myself. Can you get the side arugula salad to the table? Can you get the charred broccoli added? What about that Brussels sprout slaw? Get it first. If you're having vegetables, fiber-rich foods before a dense carbohydrate meal and you're eating an order of protein, if you're eating an order of having the Fab Four before you have the pizza and pasta, you actually blunt your blood sugar response. And we used to walk to these places because we lived in Brentwood in a condo for a long time. We lived and there so too. Mm-hmm. after our dinner, we would get to walk home. And so mm-hmm. those are two other hacks, which is like if you're having your veggies and your and your fiber and your protein first, you're blunting the expression of that blood sugar curve because it's gonna you're gonna have to digest through that stuff first before you're getting to the pizza or the pasta. And then the movement after the meal is one of the fastest and easiest levers to bring post um post meal glucose down. And so that like grandma style, grandpa style walk after dinner is yeah. phenomenal for everyone. So Little things that you can add, you know, to your day. It doesn't have to be so strict Mm -hmm. and it can be really light and flexible without having drama. And really, you kind of hit on it too, like the food drama. I just um, interviewed Dr. Will Coley. He's a, a future book coming out, and the, the, the podcast will also air after ours, yours. And um, he talks about how stress, stressing about food causes basically just as much inflammation as is as is if you ate the bad food. Oh, yeah. So when you're talking about these people that are, you know, so focused on it so much, we're actually pretty much aging ourselves as much as if you would just devour everything that you're seeing. So you were years 100%. earlier. You've already nailed it, you know. No, Will and I share a head. number of clients. I love Dr. Yeah. Will Cole. We, yeah. we, we, we work really well together and we – You'd be like the dynamic duo for sure. One of my favorite functional MDs for sure. Anyone mm-hmm. on that side of the coast, I'm like, let's do let's do Dr. Will Cole. So. Yeah. He, he's actually from my home t- – well, Pittsburgh, my hometown, mm-hmm. but even closer in the suburbs too. Oh, I love so, that. Yeah. So you talk about your Fab Four and you have your Fab Four smoothie. So can you tell me what is your Fab Four smoothie all about? And do you have some recommendations, <clears throat> recipes that you absolutely love? Absolutely. So everyone likes a quick breakfast. Everyone doesn't know what to eat when they break the fast. And so for me, it was a tool that I created for my clients who would tell me they didn't have time to eat when they woke up or they'd get really hungry before lunch at the office and then they'd make bad choices when they ordered their takeout lunch. And yeah. when I looked at their overall day and I saw suboptimal protein intake, it actually would have been perfect for you between these two podcasts where you had to grab something quick is to get a solid amount of bioavailable protein in, I wanted to them to be able to do it in a blender. So, mm-hmm. and I think protein shakes for a long time were sold to bodybuilders and to guys, and women would steer clear of them. And they're so supportive when it comes to body composition changes, when it comes to balancing blood sugar and feeling your best. So, it's the Fab Four and smoothie form. You fill your blender with one to two cups of an unsweetened liquid that can be coconut milk, almond milk, an unsweetened green juice, or just water. If you have a really good tasting protein powder and you're adding a bunch of whole foods, that works just fine. So one to two cups. Um, if you like it really thin, do two cups. If you like it thicker, one cup. And then you pick your protein of choice. Um, so I do have the Be Well by Kelly protein powder line. I mean, it's been I've been in business for 10 years and I just launched that a uh, year and a half ago. So really proud of it. I've tasted every protein powder on the market. It was my job to know what tasted good and what didn't. And um, and I saw a hole in the marketplace. There's a lot of protein powders with xanthan gums and emulsifiers and fillers and alcohol sugars and added prebiotics and probiotics. And there would always be something that like wouldn't work for a specific client. And I just didn't understand why there wasn't a really simple protein powder with the protein, organic vanilla, organic cacao, and an unsweet, you know, a, um, calorie free sweetener that was natural. So we use an organic monk fruit. So Mm -hmm. three ingredients. Um, wow. 
that's it. <laughs> I'm really proud of it because I drink it pregnant, share it with my kids, breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. I like, cook it into protein muffins, pancakes, and all that good stuff. Um, but the protein powder comes next. You want to aim for 20 grams. Then you want one to two tablespoons of fat. So if you're just getting started, tablespoon of almond butter, little small handful of walnuts, um, something like like that you love to thicken up your smoothie. A quarter of an avocado is delicious. So find a healthy fat source. And then fiber. So this is where you can add one to two tablespoons of chia, flax, psyllium husk, um, any kind of like fiber blend that you love. Fiber is phenomenal for keeping your regular, feeding your microbiome. But most importantly, when you think about your liver detoxifying, like I said, excess estrogen, excess cholesterol, any kind of toxin in your body, it we really need that fiber to have a complete elimination and really scrape those things off of the lining inside our gut. And so I am a huge fan of that for improving even blood blood tests with clients. So fiber, one to two tablespoons, and then leafy greens. So you can add a handful of spinach. You can add frozen cauliflower rice if you don't want to taste green. You know, but ca- gr- Spinach is amazing because you don't taste it at all. No. You can t- like kale, you can taste, and some of the other ones, you know, romaine, kind of not, you know, I don't know. There's yeah. something in romaine, but it's very mild. But spinach, you just don't taste. I feel like, yeah, you can sneak especially that with the other in. things that you put in there. If you're putting protein powder or an almond butter or something like that too, even without the almond butter, it's pretty delicious. Mm-hmm. And then, last but not least, if you are adding the extras, which would be like frozen fruit or um, if you're adding superfoods or anything like that. With the frozen fruit, I say just keep it to a fourth to a half a cup, depending on how high glycemic it is. I think people don't realize, but I've been wearing a level CGM for over a year now and really have tested the heck out of the Fab Four smoothie. I get a score a nine or a 10 if you follow the recipe every single time, no matter what, never fails. But when I start to push the limits, like, well, let me just see what a half a banana or whole banana looks like on my blood sugar. Or what happens when I do a full cup of fruit? Like it, it has an impact where we're instead of seeing your blood glucose numbers go up by 10 or less, you're seeing it 20 or 30. And that crash, especially because it's blended, then you see, oh yeah, those Equinox smoothies you were talking about were mostly sugar. And so that was something I saw 10 years ago when I was working with clients that really were jumping into juice cleansing and grabbing smoothies out, I was like, guys, no, like (laughs) this is not, this is not good for your blood sugar balance. And if you want to make a smoothie, let me give you this hack. And so Mm -hmm. the Fab Four smoothie is really, you just look in your blender after you put the liquid in, put the protein, put a source of fat, put a source of fiber, a little bit of leafy greens. That's like a small handful. And Mm -hmm. then if you want to use like frozen blueberries in it, we just keep it under a About half a, a quarter cup. cup, a half a yeah. cup. Okay. F- yeah. Fourth, fourth to a half a cup, depending on your the fruit you choose. Like if you're going for a banana, I really, I'd say like break it into thirds, freeze it in thirds, and add a yeah. third. That's, That's what probably I end the up easiest doing the time. Easiest it gives way good to do flavor it. though. <laughs> well, That's what we do. So we just do like a little bit in there. And when you have toddlers, I feel like every time I give Sebastian a banana, I'll like slice it and give him some almond butter, or peanut butter with it, and it like never fails. So I'll have like four or five little like slices. And then I have like a, a plate and yeah, I'm like, I just put the whole plate in the freezer when it's frozen. I like dump them in a bag and I'm like, oh, I'll just throw this in my, one That's of my smoothies, one of my smoothies in a few days. And it works great. So <laughs> That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. No waste. I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, you talked about your protein brand too. So initially you launched a grass-fed protein, which I love hearing because you just hear such a trend in vegan that I want to hear why you went with that first. And now you've just launched a vegan protein brand too. So let's hear about both. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, a grass-fed beef isolate is basically like making bone broth. So we use 100% pasture-raised beef. And what we do is we take fleshy bones and um, we stew them down in hot water. And what happens is it releases all of those collagen, amino acids. uh, And it's a complete protein because we are using, we're not just using bones. So you get a complete protein, a phenomenal amino acid profile. And what happens is, is the fat comes to the top. We skim the fat and we dehydrate the water. And that is pure protein without any enzymes, chemical extractors like hexane, um, no chemical residues. The only thing used to extract this protein is water and heat. That was really important to me because I'm in the stage of life where I'm like, hey, pregnant or I'm breastfeeding and don't take this away from me. Um, So really, really proud of the product and the process and the outcome. And for every 
uh, scoop of our protein, which is 24, 23 to 24 grams of protein, you're getting 16 grams of naturally occurring collagen. So these collagen um, peptides are not chemically extracted. It's coming from the best parts of the animal. So joints and ligaments versus hide and hoof. A lot of the collagen supplements oh. on the market are using hexane to mm -hmm. extract collagen peptides from skins, hides mm -hmm. of cows and hoofs and not the best bones. And so I don't have to take a collagen supplement anymore. I use my protein powder in my smoothie. I feel full and satisfied. And when I'm thinking about this period of life, when I'm thinking about all periods of life, I want to lower my, um, I want to lower my pesticide exposure. Yeah. I want to lower my heavy metal exposure. And so plants are notorious for sucking whatever is in the soil up into the plant. So depending on where it's grown, we know that rice protein is really high in arsenic. We know yeah. that pea protein is going to have the same sort of a problem. And a lot of times they're being sold to you like pea protein is being sold as a complete protein. But when you really look at the amino acid profile, it's low in methionine and that really, you know, the only one who's being transparent about it is Ritual, which um, has a pea protein, and they add L-methionine to that blend to truly make it a complete protein, um, whereas a lot of companies are just like, complete protein, and they're not adding anything to, to get there. So it's not necessarily- And then when you're already low in that because you're on a vegan diet, it's like that much lower as well. And you're not getting the satisfaction factor of, hey, I'm putting a scoop of 20 grams of protein in my smoothie to actually feel full and to get myself to my next meal yeah. so that I can make healthier choices and not be in a blow, like hangry, low blood sugar state mm -hmm. and to hold on to this lean muscle mass so that my metabolism is, is kicking. So for me, it was kind of a no-brainer because animals act as a filter for any type of chemical when it comes to um, you know, heavy metals, they don't have a problem with heavy metals. We have zero parts per million when it comes to lead, arsenic, mercury, things that you might find in soils that end up in plants. We don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that we would have to detoxify out of our body. And, and when you're pregnant or breastfeeding, it's not the time to be detoxifying that stuff anyways. So it was a no brainer for me that I was going to go with an animal based product. Um, but I also love it because it's soy free, it's gluten free, it's dairy free, it's nut free. Um, you know, some of the biggest offenders for people that they might have an allergy to something that's in the protein, so they can't eat it. Um, and then really stripping away all of the nonsense. If you're making a whole food smoothie, and you're adding avocado and spinach and chia and blueberries, and you're adding like a little bit of your superfood like turmeric powder or something, you don't need me to add probiotics, prebiotics, vitamins and minerals. A lot of times when I'm looking at the bags that have fortified blends of protein powder, it's totally the improper forms of these vitamins that if someone has gene mutations like MTHFR, mm -hmm. but they're going to build up in their body versus be something that is actually beneficial. It's more toxic than beneficial. Oh my gosh. Well, I have that too. So, <laughs> but a lot of ladies definitely have, you know, more and more people are have that as well. Yeah. Um, so then you came out with a vegan. So what, what are you doing with the vegan then to, to, I'm sure you want a complete protein in there. Yes. So what's interesting is I wasn't going to come out with a vegan protein because there wasn't a vegan protein available on the market that I was even keen on using. And then um, with my vegan clients, I use the Brahmi Lupini bean, which is like this little white – it's like a – it looks like a – it's actually – pretty big. It's a white bean. It's a complete protein. It's naturally ketogenic or low carb. So it's a really low carb bean. They use it in the Mediterranean. They use it in South America in like ceviches. Down in mm -hmm. South America, it's called the chocho. Mm -hmm. So in certain parts of the Mediterranean, it's called the lupini bean. The variety of it is the chocho bean down in South America. And again, these are traditional beans that have been used for a very long time. And one of the things that is a problem with plant-based beans is that they contain high amounts of phytic acid, which phytic acid is an anti-nutrient that keeps your body from being able to absorb minerals. And um, it's hard on your body. It's hard on your gut lining. And so they actually, um, they are lectin-free and uh, minimal amounts of phytic acid. So there are so – we also – the process of, of creating this chocho bean powder, so it's a 100% chocho bean powder. So we take the beans 
and we soak them and we crush them and soak them. So we're lowering the amount of all the anti-nutrients present. They're com- it becomes completely lectin free. It's a hundred percent complete protein with a full robust amino acid profile. So really, really satisfying and naturally um, lower in carbohydrates and fiber. So it's easier to digest. Um, so I'm really, really proud of that protein powder, man. It took me over a year to source it. I had to send back I had my, I purchased some, I had a container come, it didn't meet specs. I sent it back. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of time and effort, but I just have, I have a zero, I have zero tolerance for any problems when it comes to production and quality, because I wouldn't be doing this to be a me too product. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like my, my sisters are pregnant. They're drinking this protein. My clients, you know, like I just, Mm -hmm it has to be, it has to be perfect or, and that's one of the reasons why I chose not to take investors or, or have a board or advisors is because a lot of times it ends up becoming about the bottom line. And Mm -hmm. this is an, an addition to my business. And so like at one point, my beef protein went out for six weeks because the organic vanilla bean that we get from Madagascar was out and I wasn't going to use a vanilla extract with maltodextrin and it would have been cheaper and I would have made a bigger margin. Faster, yeah. But I ultimately was like, we're just going to go out of stock for six weeks. And if the people really like the protein, they'll be back in six weeks when we're available again. And it's hard decisions to make, but like that's not a hard decision for me because it's it's quality or bust. Yeah. And I think, I mean, your supporters and the people, one, you're providing wisdom. And I think knowledge is power. And the more that you understand, the more you're going to be consistent with something and stick with it. So not only are you providing this like absolutely top quality product we can't find on the market, truly, because I've been through all of it too over 20 years, but the wisdom of why we need that, you know, and with that, what's great is that I mean, I understand it in having the skincare and also like our side supplements as well. It's just, it's hard. And we do go out of stock because you have to wait for that high quality. And especially with after post COVID, all that kind of stuff that changes in the world, but, or even packaging changes and trying to do what, what you can with that. But when the consumer understands that they want quality and then they, that they need it truly for their health over a lot, like long time that they're going to stick with that. And that's Definitely. great that you're you're sticking with that because that's hard as a person that owns a business here on yourself too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because you Not put fun, a lot but... of yeah, investment <laughs> into it, time and money and all that to wait for, you know, wait for the follow-up. And so it takes a lot of heart and soul to do that as well. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time, although I could talk your head off. You're just <laughs> you're learning so much information. But two for, um, I guess, the parents out there too, both, but – one will be one's kids and then one's about traveling. So first the kids, you mentioned, I, I feel like I have set, I mean, use the Fab Four to create your kids' meals. Do you believe in, are they supposed to eat five meals, three meals? Can they eat a little bit more spaced? Like what are we supposed to do with the kiddos? Yeah. So my kids have three meals and a snack mm-hmm. um, and sometimes three meals and two snacks, but we go, we have breakfast and they can make it to lunch, but their lunchtime slightly earlier. So they eat around 11. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have a snack, uh, sometime around two to three. And then we have dinner at around six. And the only time we would have a second snack is if we had some kind of disagreement at dinner and someone didn't eat something and I am more worried about them making it through the night. Yeah. And so there may slight <laughs> there may be a I'm a, a meze during book time for <laughs> ultimate tank for, fill up for you so for that sleep. Yeah. I get to sleep. Um, yes. And not eat, you know, like I I think I'm a like my grandma, I'm worried that my kids are freezing and that they're starving like yeah, all the time. Me too. Like Chris yeah. is like, their room is 72. I'm like, is that too cold? What pajamas are they in? And they, and I know, I know the science tells me like kids sleep better at 68, adults sleep better at, you know, 66 to 68. And you're like, that's freezing. Um, so, but the thing is for me, it's really less about it's, it's that first meal of the day is really getting the, getting my boys to a place where I can get them to sit down and eat some source of protein. We ha- we do chicken sausage. We do, you know, Fab Four smoothies. We do eggs. Um, 
we do leftovers. Like I've been known to bring chicken soup out like seven mm-hmm. in the morning um, because I'm just looking for that first meal of the day to have some source of protein in it. And they'll, you know, not that they'll fight me, but they'll ask for a banana. We talked about a banana with peanut mm-hmm. butter and I'm cool with that. Um, the sausage is probably in the pan. The eggs are in the pan. I'm working mm-hmm. on an even de- more dense form of protein for yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're just not having naked carbohydrates. So when you think about pancakes with syrup, that's a, that's, a double spike naked Ugh. carbohydrate right there. And if it's that like is little your child, monsters running around later. <laughs> yeah. It is it is it may not you may not be even tying behavior to food choices. But mm-hmm. for me, because this is my science and I work really hard to support my kids' blood sugar, I know when I mess up. I know when we go to a birthday party. I know Sorry. when I've said yes to sugar too often. It's so hard, especially as you go through the holidays, Halloween, all the parties, weekend birthday parties. It's You got to be strategic. And I'm not going to be the parent who doesn't let my child partake in a group. Um, mm-hmm. So it's really about how we're going into these events and how we're coming out of these events. Maybe not waiting. It's like you give them breakfast. You know you have a noon birthday party or 11 11- you know, AM birthday party. And it's like, okay, let's get you a protein snack, you know, yeah. before you go, knowing that you're very soon going to have maybe pizza, like some fats, the carbohydrates. It's pizza right? and cupcakes every yeah, time. Some fiber before. So, yeah. yeah. So it is like, here's the thrive, here's the thrive market olive pack. Here's a chomps beef stick. Or here's, you know, my kids do a lot of nuts. I know some parents that scares <laughs> them, um, but my two and four year olds just, eat the heck out of like cashews, pistachios, almonds, um, you know, walnuts, all of it. So we, I rely, I do rely on like those little things or, um, keeping them, you know, keeping them satisfied, just like you're saying on the way in and the way out. So if you know, you just had that massive blood sugar spike and you're coming down, uh, expect it. 90 Mm -hmm. minutes later, that crash is going to be pretty hard. And how can you intercept it with some protein? Mm-hmm. I love. It. You need to write a book, please, of just recipes at this point for kids. I know. You know what's I so need funny is that's um, something I've pitched and that I want to do. So it's not out of it's not uh, totally out of left field. It's something yeah. I really, really want to do. It's just so funny because publishers try to think bigger. How can we be? How can I this know. be a book for? men, women of all ages. And yeah. and I'm like, but I'm in this stage of life where we all need a lot of help and I need the recipes that We don't that have time are, to research it. Yeah, that are blood yeah. sugar balancing. I can like, I can see it now. It's like, here's a pancake that yeah. has protein powder and or it has, yes. you know, eggs in it. And this is your, and then just call here's out. Here's your this snacks. Is, and I go this like this. And I'm like, what yeah. am I snacking for today? Yeah. What am I grocery shopping for this week? And I'm like, okay, you know. Yeah, you know, Absolutely. It, the could preparation takes so much. Yeah. Yes. Well, totally. call, I'll call those publishers. Thanks. <laughs> Harper yeah. Collins. Harper yeah. Collins. <laughs> I think Kimberly Snyder was saying she went through the same thing. She recent last year, she published a book and it was like the first few, it was supposed to be her first book. And she had to then write the publishers, you know, turned everything and everything works out for a reason, but she right. did get that book. So don't you worry. You will get that book. But I need it now. <laughs> I you know. have blog posts with it too. I've seen on your blog. You also have some, the kids recipes and all that kind of stuff too. So for I have been to go. sharing a lot more mm-hmm. there for all mm-hmm. the, and I, and I send all the, whenever I do a new recipe or a a scientific breakdown. I send it out in my newsletter. So you guys can. And I, I write those, so it's very yeah. easy. Oh, nice. Be well by Kelly is her. Um, Be well by Kelly dot com is her website. Okay, last but not least, and you might have answered most of these too. Just like the eating out, you know. Whenever I mean, I was going to say going through holidays. I mean, there's always holidays coming up from. Christmas, Valentine's Day, New Year's, <laughs> I know. Easter, whatever, Fourth of July, <laughs> but travel time. What do you recommend for people that travel a lot, that are going out to eat a lot, um, that are ordering in? I mean, I know too, and I don't have time. We don't even go out anymore, but we're actually ordering food on the weekends. And my husband sounds similar to yours, ordering just the (laughs) – putting him in charge of the order. And then we just get a lot of carbohydrates and bad fats. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's a great question. So I like to be a little bit prepared. So what I do, do and have done with my husband is we have a Google doc and, um, it's really, 
silly, but I will, when I'm in the right mindset, be like, what are our favorite places to take out? And what are, what are like the healthiest options are really nourishing for our family? What are the things that are kind of grindy and we really love, but like we can't have all the time. Mm -hmm. And we kind of rank those. And so like, for example, this place of Vila's is coming to mind for me, which is like this, a Mexican restaurant, really delicious, traditional Mexican food, but they do a mamacita soup, which is a home style whole chicken, chicken pulled, chicken soup loaded with veggies, cilantro, the limes, the, you know, the rice. It literally is like so nourishing and delicious. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, the taquitos are on the menu too. And chicken fried in a deep fryer in a taco shell is absolutely delicious. So, um, <laughs> so I, we did that. We got together. We did that for our, the meals we make as a family, actually. So like if I'm making tacos for the family, if I'm making – you know, an Italian meal, if I'm making my sheet pan chicken, if I'm doing a quick curry salmon, something like that. Chris has all of those. We have these shared docs, all the meals that we make. Cause I'm the kind of person I'll get in the habit. And all of a sudden I'm just making the same three meals again. I'm so over it. And then you're like, Oh, let's do takeout. Cause I'm yeah. over the meals I'm making. So remembering where you can take out and what oh. is nourishing and out there for you and what you can make for your family is really, really helpful before you go grocery shopping and before you decide to, um, you know, just get that same takeout order. I may just tell Chris, just add a couple of those soups to the meal. We'll sit down with that for that first. I'm not saying you can't get the taquitos, but when we just plate the taquitos for the boys first, I don't feel like that great about it. And mm -hmm. he knows he, he has been with me long enough to know that like it affects me. Like I don't, I'm mm -hmm. like, I, I feel like a bad mom. Like I know that mm -hmm. I shouldn't and they're so lucky that they're getting food and that, but I, but I, ha I get hard on myself because it's something that is a, a pillar for Passion. me. It's something yeah. I care very deeply about and I know the science behind it. So it starts to bother me. And so when we have these other options or if I'm traveling for work or something, I'm in New York, he will pick the options that I feel good about which like have my emoji gold star next to them. And I'm like, I like this from this place. I like this from this place. And then I know he's putting in the effort or I'm putting in the effort to, if we're taking out, make a healthier choice. And I do a lot of things where I do a swap too. So for example, siete tortillas are these almond flour tortillas. A lot of times from a Mexican restaurant, for example, it's chicken and lettuce and guacamole and, and pico de gallo and that's all well and good and, and delicious, but three of those tortillas may end up having you with a really high blood sugar spike, but you don't have the ingredients in your kitchen and you don't want to do the work. So I always say, well, can you, instead of getting the tacos, can you get the big taco salad and make your own tacos in your yeah, tortillas? And that. so whether it's like keeping the siete tortillas around or I have these unbuns, which are like kind of like a keto burger bun. I'll get the burger lettuce wrapped from the restaurant, have it sent to me. And if I'm like, gosh, I really just want it in a bun, I'll toast up my own. And mm -hmm. then it's like this compromise I'm making where I don't ever feel bad about the takeout because I'm like, hey, they served up the protein, fat, fiber, and greens for me. And I just picked my own like lower carb carb. And I feel yeah, like I, it's a I'll compromise. Hear. Yeah. Those are all great ideas. That needs to be in the book too. And, and how you put that Google doc together <laughs> yeah. also needs to be in there, please. <laughs> yeah. I've lost so many recipes from years past and I've tried to organize them in some way. And then, you know, I'll like see it pop up on social media or something from five years ago. I'm like, where's that recipe? That was so good. <laughs> I know. I know. It needs to be like our grandma's where we just put it on three by five cards and keep it in a yeah. box. But we <laughs> use the internet now. So yeah. Yeah. it's hard. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's not all in one area. Well, thank you, Kelly. I've learned so much. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, what I'm eating and what my kids are eating uh, in such a better way. And I will tell you, like, as you have a third too, you know, I have three little ones now, it gets harder and harder because you have different taste buds and you're a little bit more rushed. You know, I find that each child eats a little worse. <laughs> so I don't yeah. know what this third one. So I, I got to get back to it where they really, um, especially the proteins, like increasing the proteins for them because they're, they're nonstop too. And just for the family too. So I'm going to go on uh, going, I'm going to, you know, scour your blog right now. Be well by Kelly too. And guys, she gave us 10% um, off her protein. So thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to scoop that up too. And I'm really excited about the beef protein because I have been on vegan proteins forever, but you know what? I stopped making smoothies because I 
felt like my energy was just plummeting after them. And in one, I've had too much fruit, like you're saying. And um, I think it's the the protein brands that I was using. So I'm really excited to use that beef protein. Mm-hmm. And it's so great for your gut, that protein too. And I don't have a collagen like that because I use a, a marine-based collagen right now. So yay, I'm super excited. So awesome. the quote, the code is Christine10 for 10% off. It's just Christine10 for 10% off. Go to BeWellByKelly.com and also follow her on Instagram because she has so many tips, uh, Be well by Kelly, and then her podcast too um, on all major platforms as well. You have to tune in because she has such great experts just like herself. So Aww. thank you for joining us and good thank luck on you. your pregnancy, especially you're doing so, <laughs> I mean, you're so coherent for being sick and in your first trimester. You know, <laughs> Would, I wouldn't like, have been this way a few green. weeks ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like green. Like, they say it gets worse each pregnancy. And so, I feel that. Yeah. I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, well, Christine. I can't this wait to really see fun. how it all progresses. Yeah. And thank Thanks. you so much. And congrats on the new protein too. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. So thank like you. Thank you. a new little you. baby. Thanks for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and feel free to share this with a friend or family who needs to hear it. Have questions you need answered? Text me at 1-310-361-8697. Make sure you're following me on social at Christine Bullock and have a healthy, happy week. See you next time.